Thank you very much, Eva. Um, I'm uh, doing the PowerPoint now, um, and the, 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 the two speakers, uh, um, the, the second half of the speakers is using PowerPoint. Um, okay, so th thanks a lot, Kenneth, uh, for inviting me here, and, and of course, Eva. Um, well, the European Care Wall. If we um, look at what the European Union actually uh, has to say about the um, about, about migrant women in in Europe, it's this: they say effective and responsible integration of immigrants in the labour market and in society is one of the key factors of success in reaching the Lisbon targets. The gender perspective is to a large extent lacking in integration policies which hampers the possibility to fully utilize the potential of immigrant women in the labor market. This statement actually reflects um, the rhetoric credo made by policymakers in many European countries. However, usually it is not so clear what is meant by integration neither what is meant by integration in the labor market. And actually, it is, I, I started with this because this is as far the European Union gets with uh, thinking about especially immigrant women in, in Europe. What they do not talk about is what I will t speak to you uh, about today. In my presentation today, I will speak about a group of migrant women whose work is mostly invisible and whose presence in the labor market is actually hardly ever discussed by policymakers when they talk about labor migration. These women are new migrants, and they are also, um, we can speak about this later, they are um, kind of a temporary uh, migrants or circular migrants. Um, uh, they um, and these women work as domestic and care workers in the private households of Western, Southern, and partly Northern European homes. They are paid badly. The work they do is socially very important, one could say, but nevertheless, they can hardly use this fact to negotiate better salaries. In, uh, and also not better working conditions. This is a group which is numerous, as we will see. However, the individualized work environment, they work in the private households, makes it difficult to get up for collective organization. Um, I have uh, organized my presentation in the following way. I first will speak about domestic and care as work, about different types of migrant care work, um, about the European care curtain, what, um, what I uh, understand, why I use this term, uh, about very shortly uh, about welfare and migration regimes, about the ILO convention, decent work for domestic workers, and, about, uh, and then we will go into the debate. Okay, so... Um, one of the key problems of this work sector today is its missing recognition as work. Um, and uh, you see here, this is, a, this is a photo from the ILO uh, Convention on, on Decent uh, Work, uh, a Domestic Workers uh, Convention from June of uh, 2011, so just a year ago. Well, why is this that... Um, these workers have to come up with this thing uh, and say domestic work is work. Um, okay, so care as work, that's really um, something that, that um, is a, is a, is a, um, has a long history, uh, and the history is really, it's missing recognition as work. Um, for, um, when we look historically, we see that on the one hand, this work has always been uh, done by women and it's considered to be feminine gendered. It's anchored in the private sphere. And on the other hand, we see that, that since the dawn of bourgeois society, it has been deemed to be so-called unproductive in contrast to paid 
employment. So we have this binary here, uh, which is really a uh, uh, characteristic for modernity, where we have uh, care and domestic work, which is seen as uh, unproductive, and the paid employment on the other hand. And because Stephen was speaking about Marx and Smith, here is something what Hannah Arendt says about um, uh, this um, uh, history. She said that Adam Smith and Karl Marx sh shared a contempt for menial servants and despised their toils as parasitical, actually a perversion of labor, as though nothing were worthy of this name which did not enrich the world. Well, if we look at the history um, of this, then we can say that work in the private household was and is still categorized by economists as unproductive work. While productivity is contributed in the workplace, which is usually in the public sphere or outside the household, the private sphere is defined by consumption. And this dialectic pairing of productivity and consumption has remained core to the analysis of work, um, also in the um, adult worker society of the 21st century we are in now. The asymmetrical evaluation of paid work on the one side and housework on the other is still relevant today. So what exactly um, do we mean when we uh, talk about um, care work? Um, okay, there's something missing here. That's the thing that, that you get with PowerPoint that sometimes the, the things uh, um, disappear. Okay, so what exactly do I mean when, when I uh, talk about um, care work? Um, care work uh, has been um, care and domestic work, so there are many times there's a slash between care domestic work, um, has been um, characterized as uh, something that is um, being given um, to people who are dependent, like children, like the elderly, and like handicapped people. So to care for, uh, um, to care, care work means to care for people who are, uh, who are not, not independent and do not, cannot take care of themselves. Of course, we can also uh, speak about self-care, which is also an important part, but uh, self-care is really um, also neg uh, neglected in this debate. Um, so, um, Bridget Anderson, a colleague from, from uh, uh, Compass in uh, uh, Oxford, she summarizes the work and she calls it the three C's. Cleaning, caring, cooking. That is actually what is done in the household. Uh, Saskia Sassen, in her seminal book about the global city, and Ali Hochschild, in her work on the outsourcing of intimacy, have indicated that exactly these tasks, which the new middle classes, and uh, uh, um, well, uh, uh, especially in the neoliberal age are outsourcing increasingly to migrants. And this is a global phenomenon, right? This is not just happening in Europe, but I will speak about Europe here. Um, so what we can see also is in the, uh, the OECD, the EU is asking the national women to join the labor market. And um, what uh, actually they are not speaking about is the question, what is, go what is happening with the work that is left back in the household? So um, this, um, we are now speaking about in the 21st century, about the adult worker society, full-time uh, work for all employable adults, but this, uh, and, and more and more national women or local women are actually uh, joining the, the labor market. But what is missing is really the debate on, uh, or the reorganization of uh, household and care work between the genders. Uh, and um, the fact that this is missing is one of the triggers for this phenomenon, migrant domestic workers. Okay, so. There are a couple of characteristics of the uh, current debate about this, um, which um, 
I show here. Um, it's the care domestic work is outsourced to migrant women from economically poorer countries. And so we have a rise of a global market for low paid uh, migrant care workers. Also, um, as I said, the equal distribution of domestic and care work in the private household is unsolved. And my hypothesis is that really the extrication of domestic and care work from the private sphere is one of the most insuperable challenges of the 21st century. So um, let, let's talk about the specificities of the domestic and care work sector. Um, I, my thesis is really that there's a dis distinction from this work. Many migration researchers say, oh, well, it's just another market, right? Uh, why don't we treat it like that? And my, my um, uh, answer to that is that uh, there is a, what is different is this very intimate character of the work sphere. We have um, um, also the social construction of this work as, female, as a female gendered area uh, is different. And um, what is quite important is the highly emotional relationship between employers and employees. So the care recipient is also the employer, right? So, so this is a very special uh, relationship. Um, it's highly personalized, uh, and um, also it's, oh, there's mutual dependency. Um, so the, the logic of care work, uh, I would say, is uh, also different from the logic of other employment, uh, because, uh, for instance, some of the, um, um, the skills you need to do care work um, are very different from the skills you need um, I don't know, as an academic, right? You need to be uh, quick, efficient, all these kinds of things, but you have to have patience, you, you know, you have to work with, uh, to work with people, and um, it cannot be done within a certain time frames, and all these questions are uh, really uh, very um, characteristic for this kind of work. And also, and I will come back to this at the end, it cannot just be reduced to replacement and substitution, uh, because um, in uh, this, this phenomenon of migrant domestic workers in the care curtain wasn't there uh, 20 years ago. So uh, there's also something going on between a, a, a new demand, a neoliberal society where, where this kind of uh, workers are coming. So um, in the West, um, in Western and Southern European countries, uh, um, we have um, a high demand at the moment for, um, for, my, for care workers. And um, uh, at the same time, and this is a paradox, the, our politicians um, do not really um, accept this idea. They are ignoring widely uh, this deficit, and they are denying it. Also, and this is another, an extreme paradox, is the mismatch of demand and restri restrictive migration policies, uh, which result in a, in a large sector of undeclared work in this, um, in this uh, uh, sphere. Um, and what we have, uh, what we see in many European countries is that we have a legal, uh, legal care services and irregular migrants next to each other. Um, and this is um, something that uh, exists side by side. And um, we, we, I think in the discussion, I would like to talk about the situation in Sweden, because it seems to be so different from other European countries. Uh, but uh, well, my guess is that maybe in 10 years, it will be like this in Sweden, too. But that's, that's you know, a hard <laughs> kind of, uh, OK, five minutes. Um, uh, scale and numbers. Of course, you are you are asking about um, about data, and Stephen said no. We we uh, we ha uh, always be um, critical with the data, and uh, so in uh, here we have very bad data, but we have so something like informed guesses. 
uh, that say that we have about 3 million migrant women from Central and Eastern U Europe working in Southern and Western Europe. So the, the numbers for Italy alone is uh, about a million. So this sector undergoes quick changes within uh, very short um, uh, periods of time. Uh, so so it, it, it uh, for instance, popped up in, in uh, Italy when nobody was expecting it. Um, and uh, what is more important when we talk about scale and numbers is the unwillingness of sending and receiving countries to acknowledge uh, care migration. In receiving countries, it's a kind of hidden or dirty secret, in, um, but also the sending countries are hiding it in a way uh, because uh, they um, characterize this as uh, these um, women as temporarily absent. And um, the reason why they can do this, okay, I just, I will come to that in a minute. I just uh, have, um, put for you the, the differences between the kinds of uh, workers we have here. We have live-in and we have live-out. So live-in workers are those who are doing childcare and there are a lot of au pairs. This in the Nordic countries is uh, especially in Denmark and uh, Norway is quite important. Uh, and we have the, uh, the elderly care and uh, what we see there is that um, these it started as a self-organized um, rotation system uh, so that women from Eastern Europe, because of, you know, of the um, uh, quite, um, you know, the, the, uh, we share some borders with, uh, uh, with uh, Eastern European countries, so they come for six to ten weeks uh, and they, they take care of, of a person, of children or uh, elderly, and then they go back. So this is... Um, this is why also the sending countries can characterize them as temporarily absent, right? Uh, okay, so when we look at the global, this is called, um, th this whole discussion about migrant domestic workers and care workers is part of a discussion about the global care chain. Um, Ali Hochschild actually um, characterized uh, the global care chain as the chain where there are care gaining uh, countries and countries where the care is drained from. And um, there are various views on the global care chain. So there's a feminist position that says though the, those who pay the price for this uh, are um, the, the families uh, left behind. And uh, I, I think that's uh, quite an important view. But there are also those like the World Bank uh, who are celebrating uh, this kind of globalization by saying, oh, it's a win-win situation, so everybody um, uh, gets paid for this. And there's a traditionalist view also in many countries saying um, this feminization of migration is very, very uh, critical for the families left behind, so the women should come back, right? So, so we al also have uh, see this in in, uh, um, in many countries. Okay, so the, um, I think I'm, I'm running out of time. So what I will do is actually um, tell you something, the ILO convention, I think we can um, maybe discuss this later. But what my question was really was, um, why um, are the women, the Eastern European women, why do we find so many women in Western and Southern Europe. Um, one thing that is, is uh, important to say is that these women, uh, other than the maids of the, of the 19th century, uh, they are, um, these women are well educated. Uh, they are from the local middle classes and they migrate because they want to keep their kind of, of lifestyle, right? And um, if, um, so, so the questions we had uh, to, to these women uh, is always, um, was, uh, why are they doing this? And I think um, uh, a look at the history of Central and Eastern European countries gives us a clue, namely, there are three points I want to, uh, I will uh, close then. 
Uh, first is that it is important to note that since the establishment of the socialist states, women in these countries have functioned as co-breadwinners in a political system, of course, that required the labor market participation of females in general. During the state socialist period, these, the majority of women in Eastern Europe, considered work outside the home along with family care as part of their duties as members of the society. So after 18, 1989, which is quite important as a, as a date for this, um, the, these women started to become transnational migrants. And today one can say that the legacy of state socialism in combination with the financial hardship of the neoliberal transformation uh, that generated, uh, that was generated in the Eastern European countries, generates also the conditions for the willingness of Eastern European women to migrate westwards. For these women, the tension between breadwinning and parenting um, is um, problematic because the circumstances under which this combination must be performed today um, in both sending and receiving countries uh, are prob problematic. And I think this is very important uh, for, uh, for us um, if, uh, that we never really consider that there is this uh, asymmetry uh, between Eastern and uh, wage gaps, all these uh, uh, kinds of uh, questions we have. But uh, still, I mean, these women migrate because they want uh, their families, which they cannot bring, which they stay at home, which they want them to, uh, to improve um, their uh, conditions, and they want them to have a better life than they have at the moment. Thank you very much.